Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this regular scheduled meeting of the Beaver Creek City Council. May we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Adams. Here. Councilmember Bales. Here. Councilmember Curran. Here. Councilmember Dewar. Here. Councilmember Schwartz. Here. Vice Mayor Garcia. Mayor Stone. Here. Move to excuse Councilwoman Garcia. Second. Vice Mayor Garcia. I have a motion and a second to excuse Vice Mayor Garcia. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. This time I'll turn it over to Councilmember Bales for the pledge, please. All right, if you'd please stand and join me for the pledge and then remain standing for a short prayer. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This weekend, we again saw some terrible acts of war across the globe. It is my hope and prayer that the international community will work together to help ensure a peaceful and just resolution for the good of all. At home, please grant our council with the wisdom and courage to know what to do is right and good and for the benefit of the Beaver Creek community. May we speak out when it's time to speak out and listen when it's time to listen. May we always be guided by the spirit of community, the spirit of justice, love, and peace. Amen. All right, we have some uh, minutes to approve. First, the September 18th work session minutes. Any comments? We need to approve the September 18th. Your Honor, before we do that, I don't see approval of the agenda. You're right. It's not there, but we will insert it. How about we do that? Right. <laughs> now, would you like to amend the agenda first? I would love to. <laughs> Mayor, I'd like to move that we amend the agenda to add an approval of the agenda as item four. Thank you. Is there a second to that? I'll second. second. All in favor say aye. 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 Now, is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Move to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Yes. Uh, I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda as amended. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Now the minutes. How about the minutes for the September 18th work session? Any comments? I did have a motion. To have, would you like to repeat it? Yes, Your Honor. I move to approve the um, Work session minutes of September the 18th. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the September 18th work session minutes as submitted. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next are the minutes from the September 25th regular session meeting. Comments? Move to approve the September 25th meeting minutes. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes for the September 25th. As submitted, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. I'll abstain. Thank you, sir. One abstention. All right, pre scheduled speaker. We have Mr. Ethan Raby. How are you today? Doing great, sir. How are you? What's Good. Good. Green County EMA Director. Yes, sir. First, I'd just like to thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate your time to allow me to come here to introduce myself and talk about the program. And I just want to say it's a pleasure to meet all of you, Pete, Glenn, and Chief Fiorita. It's just a pleasure to see all of you as well. And so a little bit about me. So I'm Ethan Raby. I'm the director for the Greene County Emergency Management Agency. Um, a little bit about my work background. So I spent four years as the emergency operations officer for the Montgomery County Office of Emergency Management and then came here to Greene County two years ago as the emergency operations manager, being promoted to director this past January. And uh, before that, so I got my bachelor's in public administration from Cedarville University where I got the pleasure to meet Glenn as one of my professors and got my master's from the University of Dayton. So a bit about the emergency management program. So the goal of the program is to help prepare the county to uh, prepare, respond to, and recover from disasters. And so I do that through several different programs, including planning, grants, training, exercises, and working the emergency operations center during emergencies. So with planning, that includes a lot of operational level working together with partner agencies for general emergency operations planning, hazmat planning, continuity of operations, and mitigation against natural hazards. 
I also manage several grants uh, that help to fund my office as well as support different efforts in hazmat, anti-terrorism, and uh, natural hazard mitigation. I also have to bring in different kinds of training into the county, uh, anywhere from incident command systems classes such as 300 and 400 that are some basic qualifications for police and fire if they're involved in uh, upper level incident command and management to different skills-based trainings such as damage assessment uh, post-tornado. And so there's some trainings I've been bringing in as of late. I also do exercises to help us to uh, use these plans and uh, to use them uh, in a practical way. And so with these exercises, I do an annual hazmat extra exercise that is ORC required for our local emergency planning committee. And so this year, we're actually doing one with Fairborn, which is going to be a chlorine release at the Miami Products and Chemical Company. Mm -hmm. And then next year, that will go into a full-scale exercise. Otherwise, I'll also do exercises upon request by jurisdiction. Um, and finally, also work in the Emergency Operations Center. And so the Emergency Operations Center is a planning, resource management, and uh, information sharing uh, coordination point within the county. And the majority of my experience in the Emergency Operations Center is actually during my time at Montgomery County in which I responded to several incidents, including the 2019 Memorial, Door Memorial Day tornadoes on the Montgomery County side of things, the Oregon District mass shooting, uh, three water outages, and two civil disturbance events. And so that's a big overview of the emergency management program. I also want to give a little pitch for the uh, total solar eclipse coming up in April of next year. So if you have not heard about it as uh, so we're expecting a total solar eclipse in our area April 8th, 2024. It is going to be at 3 p.m. on a Monday. And so this attracts a lot of the attention. To give you the short of it, for those who don't travel for this, this is a once-in-a-lifetime event. Mm -hmm. The last one in Ohio was, I believe, in 1867. The next one in the United States won't be until uh, 2044, and that's going to be in like, the North Dakota area. Um, and the next one in Ohio won't be until 2444. These are incredibly rare events. It, spark, it sparks a lot of tourism and a lot of travel from around the country and beyond. And so because of that sudden influx of population, experts I've talked to are, are expecting that we could possibly double our uh, county population size. If you get an idea of the county geographically, everywhere from Cedarville and Yale Springs up here, Xenia, Bellbrook, and westward, so in the entire suburban part of the county are in the path of totality. And so with this influx of population, we're expecting severe traffic congestion as well as strain on local resources from as basic stuff as groceries and gas. And so I am simply encouraging jurisdictions to make plans for their cities and villages for the eclipse, for the uh, increase in traffic within. And so that is just my short on it. If you'd like the full presentation, please let me know. And um, that is all I have for you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for Great. being here. Any questions? Welcome. Well, are there questions? <laughs> Anyone have any? I have one real simple one, and that is how do you communicate during an emergency? Are you using the sheriff? Are you using central dispatch of some sort, or how, where and how? Uh, so specifically with communications, are you talking like with the public or with partner agencies? With the partner agencies. So several ways. If I have an EOC activation, I am going to be initially calling people to respond to the EOC, and then I'll be alerting police chiefs, fire chiefs, department heads that the emergency operations center is activated through email. Um, depending on the circumstances, I may also use hyperreach in terms of for mass notification as well. So I have several ways to get a hold of um, response partners. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have you back the 1st of April. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. All right. I ordered my glasses. Next, uh, we'd have another pre-scheduled speaker, which is our own Zach White. Good evening, Zach. Good evening, Mayor and members of City Council. I am Zach White. I'm the Assistant Superintendent in our Parks, Recreation, and Culture Division. Here tonight, just to give you a brief recap of our parks maintenance uh, crew and what they did this summer. So first off, parks, what do we do? Uh, our mission is to deliver recreational experiences that enhance quality of life. And this is something that we instill in our staff uh, and we drive home every day to make sure that the work they do day in and day out truly does make a difference in the community to enhance everyone's quality of life. 
brief overview of our parks. We have 24 parks within our system that are comprised of 434 acres. We also maintain nine additional green spaces and bike hubs, bringing the total to 563 acres of maintained green space. You know, within our parks, we have 16 playgrounds at those 24 parks. We have three bike hubs, 34 different athletic fields and courts, four historical cabins and one replica barn, two memorial parks, which are Veterans Memorial and the 9-11 Memorial, a seven-acre fishing lake, a skate park, four shelters that are available for, to reserve, and then five flush restroom facilities. A little bit about what our staff does day in and day out, uh, all of the, what you anticipate with mowing and trimming, uh, playground maintenance. We do have a certified playground safety inspector on our staff. Um, athletic field maintenance, prepping ball diamonds and soccer fields, getting those ready for all the groups that come out every evening. Uh, landscape bed maintenance, tree care and planting, janitorial work, trail maintenance, event setup. We work hand-in-hand hand with Aaron and the whole recreation staff to help out with a lot of the event setup. Um, snow plowing and salting, not only do we take care of the lots and sidewalks within parks, but our parks maintenance staff does assist the public service division in the wintertime with snow removal in the, in the streets. And then uh, special projects such as, you know, uh, different playground installations, repairs, concrete work, uh, all kinds of different special projects within our parks. So how do we do all of this work? Well, we have a huge staff here of five full-time parks maintenance staff members that maintain those 500 plus acres. And uh, the five full-time staff members are comprised of one section leader that oversees the day-to-day -day operations and four operators that are out there performing the work in the parks. And they are rock stars. They're, they're an awesome staff. Um, we couldn't ask for people who are more passionate to take care of the parks in the community. Uh, they're also supplemented by two part-time parks maintenance workers that work 28 hours a week year-round as well as two part-time building attendants that perform a lot of the janitorial work uh, within the parks. Also I have support from uh, the park superintendent, myself, the recreation program supervisor, and our park secretary. And we also do rely on city staff from other divisions, especially when it comes time uh, to complete some special projects. We do pull in staff from the public service division to help us out at times. And I also want to highlight that we, we also bring in some of their equipment as well, especially when it comes to some of the construction equipment um, backhoes, bobcats, um, dump trucks, those things. We, Parks does not have a lot of that big heavy equipment, so we're bringing that equipment in as well and borrowing from public service. And then uh, during the season, if we can get seasonal staff, we aim to hire six to eight seasonal staff members to help us out in the summer with a lot of the, the mowing and whatnot within our parks. We also accomplish a lot of our work through the use of volunteers. Um, we have groups from different service clubs, local businesses, scouting groups, church groups that all reach out to us wanting to complete volunteer projects. In 2022, we had over 125 volunteers that volunteered more than 600 hours. And already this year, we have over 200 volunteers uh, with a little over 500 hours. Uh, and they complete projects such as playground mulching, um, help develop trails and do park cleanup, uh, trash cleanup, and then special projects, especially as it relates to Eagle Scout and Girl Scout projects. Uh, we also utilize contractors to help us out for where our staff and volunteers can't uh, complete all the work. They use contractors to fill in the gaps. And some of this is for more technical work, especially with the tree pruning and removal. Um, we do have utilized contractors the last several years because we have not been able to get all the seasonal staffing in to mow parks. So we've resorted to using some contractors uh, for more of the open green spaces that are, there's no playgrounds, there's just open fields. Uh, some of our, our using contractor to mow some of those areas. Um, we're using contract services for landscape bed maintenance, pest control, and then some of the general plumbing and electrical work that's needed. So a little recap of 2023. Uh, earlier this year, our staff uh, worked at Cinnamon Ridge Park to develop a new trail. Um, this trail is about seven-tenths of a mile out and back from the Platner Trail entrance. Uh, and we were really excited to get this, this project completed because this park was just a a wooded lot at the time, um, and our staff was able to develop this trail and then provide off-street walking for that neighborhood. Uh, and that's in the Willow Run neighborhood. And that neighborhood does not have sidewalks for the most part. So to be able to provide them an opportunity to have a place to go for a walk or hike off of the road uh, was a huge benefit. 
at Merrick Park, we were able to complete several projects. The, the main one was replacing an aging bridge, so our staff did that one completely in-house. Um, we also made some ADA, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, upgrades, so providing uh, ADA accessible sidewalk access, um, access to the shelter, playground, and grill, and then made some stormwater improvements while we were there as well. We've done a lot of work the last, over the last year with playground mulch installation. Again, of our 16 playgrounds, there's a lot of maintenance and upkeep that's needed. And you can see here the list of parks that we've had uh, playground mulch installed just in the last year. Um, volunteers have helped out with the majority of these. And each of these locations receive a whole semi-truck load or 100 yards of mulch, with the exception of Shout Park, which received three semi-truck loads of mulch. Um, and then the volunteer groups we have, uh, they do a fantastic job. So if there are any groups looking to uh, complete a project similar to this, uh, 10 to 15 volunteers is ideal. And we will bring a staff member out that, that brings a bobcat to help move the mulch from the MIG pile out into the playground and the volunteers help smooth and spread that out. Um, so thank you to all the volunteers that have helped mulch our playgrounds, but we do have a need continuing on uh, moving forward. So if anyone is interested, please reach out to our office for that. At Springhouse Park, uh, besides the completion of the master plan, uh, we had a lot of volunteers out there at the end of July to help develop a new trail system, uh, doing general park cleanup, picking up trash and uh, broken glass and cans and, and other stuff like that. Our staff also installed a gravel parking lot that holds about 20 to 30 cars. We installed park signs to help uh, find directional signs and some master plan signage out in the park so as uh, people are out hiking and exploring, they can kind of see what uh, that master plan calls for where different amenities would be located within the park. Uh, our staff is also mowing the open field areas, which is almost 100 acres of that 148-acre park. Mm -hmm. So we've done that twice so far this year, and we'll mow it down one more time uh, before the end of the year. And then we had a contractor come through and demolish the old unsafe structures that were on site. Uh, just to highlight some of the ADA improvements, that we've made throughout the park system. We are currently in our third year of a 10-year program. Uh, some of the projects this year included uh, making some restroom upgrades at Dominic Lufino Park. A lot of that is adjusting the grab bar heights, uh, putting in new signs with braille, um, adjusting the angles of the mirrors so that anyone that would be in a wheelchair would be able to uh, see the mirror. Uh, we did the same thing at the Senior Center, a lot of um, restroom upgrades at the Senior Center, also correcting protruding items. So for instance, like hand dryers and mm -hmm. towel dispensers, can't protrude more than four inches from a wall, so we're buying ADA compliant um, amenities for the, for the restrooms and installing those. Um, I spoke with you earlier about some of the Merrick Park upgrades. Um, what we're trying to do is we are in a park doing a project, uh, such at, at Merrick Park, we did the bridge replacement. We took a look at what was required to get that park in compliance for the ADA uh, report that we had done a few years ago, and we were trying to tackle all of those projects while we're there working on one. So uh, moving forward is we're at a park doing one upgrade or project, we're looking at all of the ADA uh, work orders associated with that park and trying to do them all at the same time. Uh, and then at Stafford Park, um, this fall our staff will be installing a new accessible route sidewalk to the playground and a new picnic table at that shelter. So upcoming, uh, our staff is currently working on installing new hardscaping at the Senior Center within the parking lot islands. They're installing landscape rock and colored concrete. Uh, it would make that a little bit easier for us to maintain. We'll have to worry about trying to mulch and maintain some of the, the landscaping within the parking lot. Um, again, adding ADA, ADA access to the playground at Stafford Park. And here towards the end of the month, we'll be installing 21 new trees within our park system. Those parks are going in at Rotary Park, um, Seville Park, and Walnut Grove. So there's 21 new trees going in at each all of those parks. Um, asphalt maintenance. Uh, here this week, we have a contractor installing a new paved walking path around the perimeter of Gershbacher Park. And then here, um, coming up later this year, uh, before the weather breaks, we will be paving a new pedestrian access walk at Nutter Park and sealing and restriping the parking lot at Dominic Lafino Park. As we kind of look out into what's coming up in 2024, two of the bigger projects uh, at Stafford Park is replacing the uh, pedestrian bridge there much like the one at Merrick Park, it has exceeded its life expectancy, it's in need of replacement. So our staff is working with the engineering division to work on ordering and replacing that new pedestrian bridge. And then next year, uh, we'll look to replace another playground. Of the 16 playgrounds we have, we have replaced 11 of those 16 since 2015. So there are five remaining 
Uh, we're looking to replace the one at Walnut Grove sometime next year. Hmm. And the average life expectancy for a playground is about 20 to 22 years. And that's the brief recap I had. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Hmm. All right, very good. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? I just want to congratulate the department. I think you guys do a fantastic job with a very small staff, highly effective, and uh, as citizens in this community, should really appreciate your job. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be sure to pass that on. I'd like to echo those comments. I guess that I was unaware that there were only five full-time employees working on <laughs> our parks, with one of them being a supervisor. And so I just want to also share those sentiments. Thank you for all of the hard work and the dedication. My family and I visit many of the parks, and they're always in pristine condition. So thank right. you for that. Thanks. I'll share that as well. Yeah. Yeah, with Three Irish kids were in a lot of the different parks, so we have benefited greatly. Thank you immensely to you and your staff. Uh, two questions. Um, one with trees in these parks. Is there certain regulations in terms of cutting branches at a certain lengths? I've seen those periodically where they've been cut in areas. Just kind of curious, is there some kind of process that happens with that? Are you, is, it, uh, is this like tree pruning through our yes. parks? Yeah, so our staff goes through it periodically. Hmm. Um, we try to get through all the parks once a year to prune trees. Um, also, what we've been trying to do is we plant new trees. We mm -hmm. work on doing young tree pruning to work on getting proper tree structure when they're younger so that they require less pruning as they, they get mature. Yeah, it looks great. The downside is our kids can no longer climb the trees. So it does leave <laughs> some tears in there. And I said I would fall off on that to them. Um, Following the Memorial Day tornado, one of the tops came down at Royal Point Park. Any plan to put it back? There's only one of two that's there that go kind of completely across the, the park. Yeah, so we put it back temporarily, mm -hmm. and when it was reinstalled back, we also had the new playground installed yep. at that same time. Mm -hmm. And what we were finding were kids were going and climbing on top of the playground equipment and then climbing on top of the shade canopy. Uh, and sitting on top of the shade canopy, which was not meant for people to sit on. Um, so we were working with our playground manufacturer to see if we can troubleshoot and find a way to get that reattached. But um, I think what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to put a new pole in to raise the height of the shade structure so that people can't climb and sit up there. So we had to take it down because it became a safety issue. The last thing I wanted was somebody to, to break that and fall through and get hurt. And for the record, not my kids. Nor you. That's a good point, Mayor. <laughs> that's a good... But thank you so much for you and your staff. Appreciate it. Thanks. Zach, to uh, add on to Councilmember Curran and, and Schwartz's comments, I also want to thank you and your team for doing the amazing job that you do. And on top of uh, all that you do, you also maintain like the, all the softball diamonds during the summer, all the soccer fields get lined, and on top of it have to keep up with the mowing and everything else. So it is, it is quite amazing um, the amount of work that gets done with the limited staff that you've got. So thank you. Thank you. You definitely have some rock stars out there. There's no question they're out there working all the time. And the fact that you get all the volunteers that you do is another feather in your cap. I mean, just... I think people realize that our park system is, is, is a good park system. They want to do what they can to help you keep it that way. And yeah. we really appreciate all the work you guys do. Thank you. And it's my hope that uh, somewhere down the road that we can uh, increase your staffing a little bit. So that, uh, <laughs> but, uh, I think they would all be the best. Uh, they, they work hard. So thank you very much. Thank you for all the nice comments. I'll be sure to share that with our staff tomorrow. All right. Thanks. Sam. Thank you. Have a great evening. All right, next, ordinances, resolutions, and PUDs. First is Ordinance 23-23. Ordinance 23-23, an ordinance to declare certain city-owned property interests as surplus and to approve the conveyance of a monument sign easement on city-owned property, generally known as 15-acre Grange Hall Road property at the southwest corner of Research Boulevard and Grange Hall Road. Thank you. All right, this is the second reading of this ordinance. Is, are there any changes? Any additions? All right. Uh, I'm not sure who sponsored this. I made the motion. All right, would you like to sure. follow up? Motion to approve Ordinance 23-23. Second. 
I have a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 23-23. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next is Ordinance 23-24. Ordinance 23-24, an ordinance amending the zoning map by rezoning approximately 50.0085 acres of land from A1 Agricultural to R-PUD Residential Planned Unit Development, located on the west side of North Alpha Belbrook Road, approximately 1,200 feet north of the intersection of North Alpha Belbrook Road and Indian Ripple Road, and further described as Book 6, page 19, Parcels 1 and 2 on the Greene County Property Tax Atlas. Thank you. Were there, uh, this again is the second reading of this ordinance. Are there, and, and there was a lot of discussion at the public hearing. Are there any changes at this point that uh, need to be addressed? Okay. The, most of the comments and the discussion the last time was focused around site plan. And uh, we'll address those issues then. All right, I'm, again, I don't know who sponsored this. I have a, uh, before we go into okay. that, that phase, I was not at the last meeting. All right. But I got an opportunity to uh, rewatch the meeting and uh, kind of digest the, um, um, all of the conversation. And so I guess um, I would just maybe have a, a question for Randy um, about the easement and express maybe my preference and for a woodland easement even though it's more challenging to manage i think that there's language that can be written in fact it was in your staff memo about um, a woodland management plan that could be written to kind of mitigate some of the ongoing issues such as invasive species mm -hmm. Um, cause as much as I want to preserve the woods, I don't want it to be overrun with honeysuckle at right. the same time. Um, and with that 16 foot horse trail, it really only leaves about nine feet of wooded area. Correct. Um, if it's 16 the whole way down. Right. And so forth. Sure. I'm, I'm sure it does. does but my point is it's not much forest anyway. And so um, to have it protected, um, I think, would, would be a benefit to certainly the neighbors in um, Terra that back up to it. Um, but if we put a plan together, like you referenced in your staff memo, to manage it wisely, it might be um, doable um, without giving so much discretion to the new property owners. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that is certainly something, and I'd be more comfortable, like, addressing that at the site plan stage where this is just the general idea of having a easement, and then we can add to it by um, motion when it gets to the second phase. Um, if there's additional, like, call it a, a um, green space easement, and then only invasive weeds and other undesirable uh, stuff be trimmed and everything else be left alone. I mean, you can do that. I just, again, I would prefer that it stay at the uh, uh, homeowners association, maintain that rather than the city. Um, but of course, that's up to council's discretion on who maintains that. But it's um, it, it's a challenge for us, especially if we start that precedent in every neighborhood and have something like that. Because I mean, they're all it's going to be wanted everywhere. Um, we just have more and more of these areas to maintain without the staff to be able to do that properly. Understood. Understood. As, as someone who has a brand new housing development going in right next to my house, uh, that 25 foot buffer uh, was uh, extremely important to me and my neighbors. Um, and so I feel for those folks um, in the adjacent neighborhood and um, I just feel like the green space easement puts the onus on the new HOA and the new housing development, but doesn't really protect the Terra neighbors. Um, so my preference for what it's worth would be for the um, woodland easement. Um, 
and I didn't know if that was something we needed to address at zoning or in site plan. I because it's in the in your staff report. I I suspect it's at the zoning phase. I think that that would establish the minimum standard. Then we can you can always add to that at the next phase. But of course, I mean, it's up to council if they want to change that to woodland easement here or not. It's just well, those were my comments. So. Hmm. And again, I think the goal was to was simply around staffing and the responsibility of the city that being the one to go out and decide every single tree that needs to wants that needs to be cut. Right. And if it dies, then the city going out and you know having to take it down. And we were trying to I think the idea from staff standpoint was simply not to be the babysitter, so to speak. Uh, but again, that's uh, all up. We have it in our in our rules and regulations. We can do them if we want. Yeah. Well, I, again, I, and I was just thinking if we could put together a proper management plan up front, that could be generally standardized. Um, and if it did call for the new property owner to hire an arborist and submit a form. Um, without too much work and I mean I'm not trying to put more work on your shoulders you understand but I just want to make sure that that those woods are protected um, from the current residents perspective um, not looking at it from the new HOA perspective Indeed, you know a lot, uh, quite a bit more about some of the, the parks and as it relates to parks and it comes to woods but all right so so let's say uh, the homeowner does cut a tree now who's the judge is, is it is it realized? I'm, I'm going to ask staff too. Is it, is it now the city's responsibility? Yeah, to do a something question. about that. Um, okay, I, so that there's uh, that's my issue with it is to who who's going to be the judge and jury, and that's where I think the homeowners association is the one that needs to do that. And I don't disagree with that. I mean, I don't know how practical or feasible it is at all. For the city to be involved in homeowner versus homeowner disputes regarding if a tree was cut or not um, my whole point was in order to protect the adjacent property owners you know um, that the city have the guidelines that they they are required to follow um, as opposed to the the new HOA but Either way, Mayor, Those I think you have... guidelines be put into a, to the covenants of the... I, I believe they could. It's a forest management plan that's referred to. Yeah, I mean, if it's, a, if it's something that's part of the covenants now, to where it is the, pro, the home HOA's enforcement, I, I think that's a great idea if you can define it better. Right. Uh, yeah, and that would take the, the, the penalty phase, or, or however you want to put that, uh, at the uh, court system rather than on the city because mm -hmm. if it's a private covenant and restriction then the courts you know resolve those disputes rather than city council and planning department and, and the bza and the like so yeah that, that'd be ideal i i'm in i am in support of that i guess the question that i have before we press forward with this is in the current ordinance that we have before us Item number nine specifically calls out a green space easement. So if this is something that we want to address and we would like to address it at the specific site plan phase, do we need to remove that? No, I would not remove it at this point. Um, I, I think leaving it as a 25 foot conservation easement change to a grading limit and green space easement will give us flexibility. I think the concern is that I think it's on page four of uh, Mr. Burkett's report. I think the the problem with, and this may be somewhat the problem with our regulation, but if you look at Woodland's easement, the problem with that is that if you want to cut a tree down, basically it's the city has to approve it with the property owner. And I think as a process, I understand what council's seeking, and, and Mr. Councilmember Bales, I understand what you're saying, but. But I think, unfortunately, our woodlands easement definition is um, rather restrictive and probably for most homeowners would not really uh, understand that they're not going to do much back there without getting city permission. And so then, then we'll be, you know, if somebody cuts something, then do we have a, has someone damaged something, do we have a suit between the city and the homeowner? And, and it just gets, 
it could get rather messy quickly. <laughs> so I think probably calling it a green space, the green space gives us a lot of flexibility. So I think council will have to have further discussion as to what it entails. But it can be dis it can be defined at site plan, is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it Thank I you. mean clearly the ordinance does yeah, and yeah. sorry, a long answer to a short your question, but yes, in the under the terms of it, it sure you will find it define it at some point. Okay. Thank you. All right, so as long as we can further define it and further enact some regulations that control it, then I have no other questions. Okay. Any other input? Council Member Kern, I think you were the sponsor on this one. Thank you, Your Honor. Ordinance uh, <clears throat> 2324, Bridal Wood Rezoning. A motion to approve this ordinance. Can I hear a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 23-24. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next is Ordinance 23-25. Ordinance 23-25, an ordinance to rezone 6.008 acres from I-1 Industrial to A-1 Agricultural, further described as Book 6, page 25, <clears throat> Parcel 98 on the property tax maps of Greene County, Ohio. Thank you. Uh, again, this is uh, the second reading. Is there any, are there any changes? Pretty straightforward uh, application. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Do I hear a motion? This was uh, Councilmember Schwartz actually sponsored this. Move to approve Ordinance 23-25. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 23-25. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks. Next is Ordinance 23-26. Ordinance 23-26 to approve supplemental appropriations and certify additional revenue for fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2023 and ending December 31st, 2023 and to amend ordinances 23-21, 23-18, 23-11, 23-06, and 22-32. Very good. Good evening, uh, Mayor and uh, members of uh, City Council. This is just a, uh, another uh, financial update uh, for our appropriations and certification that we passed uh, last year. And anytime we get something uh, fairly large or unusual, we have to bring that before you to uh, certify it or uh, appropriate it. Uh, we talked last month about uh, we had a couple of total police vehicles. Uh, the, we filed that with our insurance company. They ended up sending us money back. Uh, it came in at the depreciated value. Uh, I went back and realized that uh, our policy actually calls for uh, the uh, actual purchase price to be reimbursed. And so uh, being a good uh, fiscal officer, I accepted their original check with the provision that there might be more coming. And uh, there was and uh, both vehicles picked up another $7,600 from the insurance uh, reimbursement. So uh, we needed to certify that. And again, that just will go to offset the uh, purchase of the other vehicles that we got uh, to replace those. And uh, that'll, that'll go to offset those. So we need to certify the additional revenue and then uh, uh, appropriate the uh, funds for those replacement vehicles. So that'll uh, take some of that uh, burden off of us for uh, that replacement. The other thing is that uh, we just received, again, uh, amazingly enough, a, another reimbursement from uh, FEMA for the 2019 tornado. All right. So uh, <laughs> I think they actually were auditing their own uh, records and realized that uh, they missed one from us. And uh, even though we asked them about it and we uh, sent them you know, plenty of correspondence to say, is that it? It's all you're approving at this point? Uh, they finally came back and said, nope, uh, we missed the, uh, and this was for the donated 
uh, manpower that was uh, basically donated from other agencies to help us clear the debris and move it to the staging area. So uh, they sent us a check for 41346 and because we have the uh, FEMA fund, we have to certify that money coming in there, but we've been giving the money back to the department that was affected by those expenditures. So what we need to do is transfer the funds then from 250, the FEMA fund to uh, 203 to uh, uh, sort of reimburse them for some of those costs associated with that. So uh, you're seeing the uh, uh, certification of the 250 coming in appropriation for it to go out of 250 and then entering in 203 to uh, put it in their funds. Uh, I asked them if they had anything that they wanted to uh, purchase at this point to uh, utilize those funds. They uh, indicated that they don't have any pressing need right now and just to put that into fund balance when they're not appropriating money out of 203 for that $40,000. So uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I know it's a little convoluted, but anytime we get more money in here, I like to bring it to your attention to say, uh, yes, we're uh, do, doing something on the revenue side also. So okay. Every dollar helps. Yes. Comments, anybody? Well, I just think it's important to thank the other jurisdictions that provided volunteers for us to clean up uh, you know, during that calamity. We helped. Yeah, and again, all the communities, we uh, you know personally went out and thanked them. Uh, we did a uh, pretty good presentation for them to uh, the, in their uh, councils to acknowledge that they're helping out. And again, we do that for uh, other jurisdictions, too. We've helped out a couple of uh, uh, places uh, in the south. I can't remember the city that it went through, but we, we provide the same service. So I, I think it's kind of a mutual aid standing agreement and that uh, the fact that uh, you know, they weren't requiring us to pay them for their donated services. I think that goes a long way into just the cooperation that the area provides to uh, folks during these natural disasters. So, I just want to thank you for being vigilant on the insurance and going back and looking and finding out they owed us more money. Well, when I saw it, I, I originally just right away said, uh, this doesn't seem right to me. And uh, it was one of those things where we have a new uh, carrier providing the, and, and that's normally the way they process it for all of their other clients. But I was like, well, since we've been on the mover board for quite a while, it was like that. And so as soon as we followed up on it, they were like, yeah, that we kind of missed that with you guys. So, and I guess they don't have a lot of total cars, and they probably don't have two in a row like we did. But, uh, you know, it uh, it all panned out. Yeah, but thank you for following up, because without that, they probably wouldn't have paid us. So, No problem. Anyone else? All right. Do we have a motion? Move to approve Ordinance 23-26. Second. Second. All right, and I'm going to back up just a minute, mm -hmm. Council. This is a new ordinance. Everything else has been a second reading. Uh, this is a new ordinance. Is there anyone present this evening that would like to address Council on this ordinance? If there is, please come forward. <coughs> Seeing none, now I will accept that motion, please. Who made that motion? Move to approve Ordinance 23-26. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 23-26. May we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Bales. Yes. Councilmember Adams. Yes. Councilmember Schwartz. Yes. Councilmember Kern. Yes. Councilmember Dewar. Yes. Mayor Stone. Yes. Next on the agenda is liquor license. Good evening, Chief. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of Council. I have a couple of them, so we'll get started with the first one. Uh, before you have a uh, new liquor permit request for um, Ohio Springs Incorporated doing business as Sheets, number 812, which is going to be located at 1270 North Fairfield Road. The Ohio Division of Liquor Control sent us all the documents required for this uh, permit, for the C1 and C2 liquor permit. Um, and what's different with this type of permit is we don't actually get a list of people or shareholders or personal background um, checks because it's a large corporation and the Division of Liquor Control does not send a specific name per se. So we do not have any concerns with this permit 
and staff is recommending this application move forward without any further comment. Thanks. Motion to accept without comment. Second. I have a motion and a second on the table. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right. The second one, a little bit different. The Ohio Division of Liquor Control sent us notification of a request for a new D1 liquor permit for Major Hitters Athletic Center, which is located at uh, 3415 Dayton Senior Road here in the city. Uh, the completed um, records checks that were required were done by the by us that are required of the Division of Liquor Control on those applicants and shareholders. And staff is objecting to the issuance of this uh, permit um, pursuant to Higher Revised Code 4303-292. And I'm um, going to be recommending that the, there will be an adoption of a resolution that Mr. McHugh will explain. All right, thank you. Mm. Do you want the resolution read first? Yes. Please read the resolution. Resolution 23-50, a resolution by the Beaver Creek City Council objecting to the issuance of a liquor permit, permit address 3415 Dayton Senior Road, Beaver Creek, Ohio, 45432, permit number 5413415, by the Ohio Division of Liquor Control to Major Hitters Athletic Center, LLC, and designating and authorizing officials or employees of the city of Beaver Creek to act in furtherance of such objections. Thank you. Mr. McHugh? Uh, yes, Mayor and Council. Procedurally, uh, by statute, uh, in order to, when we see something that we, that uh, the chief feels uh, might be grounds for an objection, um, it requires council action. And uh, while that's rather unusual, this is one of these situations where uh, the chief believes that there's some grounds that we need to be looked in a little bit further before uh, this is just something to accept uh, without comment uh, motion situation. So for that reason, I prepared a uh, resolution which will then uh, need to be filed uh, tomorrow by the deadline is tomorrow. And that's why we're kind of on a short time frame um, to uh, with the uh, and asking for hearing. And it'll, it'll be held, uh, it, it takes normally several months before you'll get notice, but it'll be in Xenia eventually it requested be in Xenia. You can either go to Franklin County or request the county. So we requested Xenia. That's traditionally what I do. Questions? And I, I, if I may, Mayor, I will just say uh, uh, Chief is being uh, uh, very cordial, of course, but uh, this is, you know, his recommendation based on uh, information he cannot share uh, publicly, it's confidential information. Let's just put it to you that way. Uh, active case, different stuff that he just can't share. So, uh, but you know, I've heard the recommendation and the reasons behind, and concur uh, with the chief. Not that you need my concurrence with it, but uh, uh, again, it's just something we can't share. Okay. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve resolution twenty-three dash fifty. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve resolution 23-50. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank Thanks, you. Chief. Next on the agenda is discussion item. And we have uh, uh, the Patels here that are going to discuss the clean air quality application. Gentlemen, please come forward and the floor is yours. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Josh Patel, and we have AJ Patel here from Scarlet and Gray Hospitality. Um, is there a way I can get a presentation up on the screen, or I can do paper copy too? We can go go a little old school. I I've got it on a thumb drive. If we could get it up, okay. We do have two other members here, um, Justin, Kale, and John. They're going to represent the engineering side of our application, so I'm just going to invite them up to give a quick overview of the program, and then we'll go into some detail on our project specifically. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is John Kirshner. I have uh, GB Solutions. We've been representing the Patels with the Air Quality Development Authority. That program uh, in that agency is expressly 
um, put together in the 70s to uh, keep Ohio's air clean. And they do it in two ways. One is direct pollution, um, either scrubbing or making sure that those don't get into the air. And two is with energy efficiency so that power plants uh, that provide the grid uh, with power have to provide, don't have to provide as much. Um, and as such, air quality and the Ohio uh, grid that we're in is in one of the um, less efficient grids in the nation as they mostly use coal. So this uh, program uh, over the years has focused in on those uh, types of applications in order to uh, clean the air. In recent years, the program has become significantly more stringent and guidelines in order to make sure that developers and people aren't taking advantage of it in a way that doesn't allow them to put their money where their mouth is. Um, this particular project is one of the most um, clear-cut examples of how you would put together an energy efficient building and exceed the even more stringent um, guidelines that air quality has put together. And I'll turn it over to Justin to explain a little bit more of the energy efficiency. Thanks, Mayor and hey, other members of council. Um, so on the on the engineering side, we're uh, my company, Energility, is an energy engineering firm, and we're working with the uh, Patels and Scarlet and Gray on the energy analysis. And as we've done that analysis, um, we've found their building to be well beyond 50 percent better than the energy code. And then with that, we took an application, submitted it with their approval to Ohio Air Quality Development Authority where they're using a much more efficient building envelope, uh, building roof, windows, all of those components of the building envelope, the HVAC systems, the lighting, as well as adding some solar panels, which based on where their development is across the street, there's uh, you know solar panels at the uh, you know, Chase Bank building uh, right adjacent. So it's, you know, it seems to be in line with the, you know, aspects of the community looking for that you know, energy efficient and sustainable improvement. So their design not only is better than 50% beyond the code, but when our work was uh, scrutinized, because we typically err on the side of conservative, the uh, engineering firm acting on behalf of Ohio Air Quality actually found that our calculations were conservative and their uh, building is exceeding 60% better than the energy code. So. Uh, we would expect once complete and operational, not only the financial benefits that the Patels are going to talk to you about, but from an uh, environmental impact, that it's going to be one of the most efficient hotels in Ohio, let alone, uh, you know, the greater Midwest area. So turn it over to Josh and AJ to talk about some of the salient details. Great. Thanks, Justin. So I'll just walk through what's up on the chart here to give um, specific details relative to the, the Marriott Hotel we're putting up. So uh, just that first bullet point there is obviously with the hotel, um, majority of our guests come from out of town, um, and there's more details that we've been provi we can provide if needed, but there is a significant economic impact there of almost $32 million. Um, and then just talking through some of the um, bullet points in summary that the uh, clean and clean energy and features that were made possible by the Ohio Air program. Um, so what Justin mentioned is this has been independently verified, but we're over 66 percent um, over code in terms of this building. So we're not just building to code; we're we're exceeding it by by quite a large margin. Um, there's 85 percent less em emissions than code, and once again, this is made pos possible by Ohio Air Quality. The third bullet there talks about the healthcare savings cost. So what that is is a estimate based off uh, creating a building to code and then comparing the building that we have designed. And that's a healthcare savings cost in terms of an asthma visit to a hospital or medical related um, expenses. So that's a nearly $30,000 figure every year. Um, and really this is benefits that Beaver Creek citizens get, right? Our employees get, um, our staff gets, and then everyone in the Beaver Creek community gets. So that's um, really, uh, a big factor of this program and a big reason why we're pushing for it. Um, to go on to the next one with the other benefits, so the property tax incentive is part of the Ohio Air program. Um, however, we still will be paying nearly $50,000 a year um, because it's not a complete reduction in property tax, it's a partial reduction. Um, also with hotels, there is the additional lodging tax that both cities and counties get, totaling in $300,000 a year. Um, and the third bullet point is 
just focusing on spending in the community. So when we establish a hotel and we bring in guests from outside the community, they spend $400,000 or $400, excuse me, um, $400 per day outside of lodging that goes to the community, whether it's food or travel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's just the, the summary of the other benefits that Ohio Air does provide. And so lastly, we know this was brought up in the, in the August meeting and with Beaver Creek City not having an income tax, the jobs created with this hotel, um, they don't provide the same benefit as it would in other communities. So what we're willing to do is to make uh, Beaver Creek City whole. So you, Beaver Creek City will get all the benefits that I listed above, but the property tax will not be affected. It'll be evaluated the same as if the um, Ohio Air program did not exist specific to Beaver Creek City. So, so that's it right there is just a, a summary of our position and, and thank you for giving us the chance to speak. Um, we just wanted to give the full story about how we got here um, and, and the whole um, pitch that Ohio Air has. All right. Well, thank you very much. I know I sat down with AJ uh, last week or so. And when a young guy can do this, why do I need to get up? I, I, I know. I, I, you know, I, wish, I need somebody over here to stop talking for me, too. <laughs> but it... Uh, but I wanted, I just wanted the opportunity for the community to see what it is you're proposing for the, for everybody to be open about what's being proposed. And uh, there'll be no decisions tonight. Uh, are there any, is there anything council wishes to add? Okay. I mean, some of us up here kind of understood some of it already and uh, but uh, we wanted this is taped so anybody can see it and it's actually live uh, so we wanted the community to be able to see it as well so we will be talking with you here in the next week or so all right okay. thank, thank you. you very much all right council time I don't know. council member schwartz have you kicked it off recently hey, would you like to start i would love to start mayor thank you um, the past, the last week, I think last Monday, um, I was able to attend a candlelight vigil that was hosted by Violence Free Futures over at the Green, as well as a lot of my fellow council members and there. Um, and during that vigil, um, we had the opportunity to hear from two survivors of domestic violence. And their stories were extraordinarily powerful um, and gut-wrenching and tear-jerking to say the very least. And so I just want to remind our community members and each of us that was there took a pledge that we would ensure that we, if we see something, we say something. If we see someone who needs help, we try to get them the help that they need. Um, for those who weren't there or who didn't get to hear, Violence Free Futures is also featuring survivor stories every day on their Facebook page. So I would encourage you to go and read some of those stories because they're very powerful and you can see that Domestic violence isn't something that's happening outside of Greene County, it's happening inside of Greene County. And I think it's significantly important that we recognize that. So I would encourage all of you to at least visit the Violence Free Futures page and read a few of those survivor stories if you didn't get the opportunity. And I wanna thank Violence Free Futures for keeping this initiative live and well and encourage our community members to attend next year if you get the chance because it's just something that is so, so powerful. Um, the next thing that I was able to attend was the Candidates and Issues Forum that was hosted by Beaver Creek Women's League. And it was a fabulous event. It was very well attended. I think moving it to the evenings was a great call um, by Women's League. There were a lot of candidates, a lot of issues, and it is actually recorded. So if you weren't on, if you're unable to attend, I would encourage you to watch. Um, lots of great questions, just very, very informational for the voting that's coming up in November. And this weekend, I was able to take my son to the Touch a Truck event hosted by the city as well as the Beaver Creek Township Fire Department. And it was such a great event. We enjoyed it. Judson came home with a yellow hard hat, and so he was very happy about that. Um, and a Hot Wheels car. So it was a great event. And so I just want to say thank um, the city and thank the fire department for all of the hard work that they put in for that event. And last, but certainly not least, I get the honor of doing employee anniversaries. So for October, we have Carol Weimer with the Senior Center, one year of service. We have Judy Lemke with the Senior Center, 10 years of service. Our very own Randy Burkett with Planning and Development, 17 years. Dylan Sanington with Police, three years. 
David Ashworth, police, four years. Nate Sparks, public service, 11 years. Libby Chapman, police, 25 years. And Chrissy Fedko with the Senior Center, 18 years. So congratulations and thank you very much for your service to this community. You are very well appreciated. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Kern. Thank you very much, um, Mayor. Had the pleasure to attend the Citizens Academy. It's our first one. And I want to give special attention to uh, Council Member Bales for pioneering this and uh, hope and expectation that we'll have many, many more. So it's uh, really, it was really significant to be there and hear the comments. Secondly, I also attended the uh, family violence function at uh, Green and heard the stirring stories of the people at, uh, that were presented on the platform. I was part of the candidate today, obviously was part of that, and uh, I want to thank the Beaver Creek Women's League for a big, uh, big crowd, a nice turnout of people, uh, good questions. It was a great evening. Attended the Associated Contractors. It was the Realtors, Home Builders, and the Contractors put on a, uh, a function downtown at the Dayton Board of Realtors to uh, inform uh, local elected officials about their uh, mission and responsibilities. I also attended the health fair uh, over at the Senior Citizen Center this uh, Saturday from uh, 10 to 12, and uh, you could actually get all three shots there. Wow. Yeah, you could get the uh, flu, COVID, and I can't remember what the name of the RSV? third one. What's it called? RSV. Yeah, RSV. yeah you get all three shots. That was super. Nice turnout. Attended the Touch a Truck, and that was fun. And uh, also uh, was part of the Rotary program for we had uh, cyclists, uh, Different, uh, uh, different amounts, 60 miles, 100 miles. There was a big turnout. We were stationed out at the Coy Middle School and uh, passed out water and, and other things to, uh, to the cyclists going through. So it was, it was a great week. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Bales. Oh, thank you. You know, as a board member of the Violence Free Futures organization, I couldn't have said it better than Councilwoman Schwartz last uh, Monday's uh, candlelight vigil was touching and tear-jerking and impactful and uh, and I would urge everyone to um, just reach out and get some information um, from them so thank you for bringing that up uh, I want to appreciate um, council for excusing me from the last council meeting not only was it my anniversary, but it was also my son's senior night in uh, golf. It was his last golf event for Beaver Creek High School. And I'm happy to say that uh, both the girls' uh, golf team and the boys' golf team have made it out of sectionals and are competing in districts this week. So I wanted to uh, give them some luck on air uh, and if they can uh, move out of districts and they go to states. So... We'll keep our, uh, our fingers crossed for them. Uh, I, too, want to congratulate the recent graduates from the Citizens Academy. Thank you to staff for putting that on. Um, I guarantee that uh, every single person who attended that academy came out of there with far more knowledge about city operations than they, they came into it with. So um, for any of the anyone interested who who wasn't able to attend this time around please uh, look for it next next year or whenever we run it again because I'm sure um, it'll be popular again and then uh, finally big thanks to the Beaver Creek Women's League for putting on the candidates and issues forum and thank you to the golf club for hosting it it was uh, very well attended and um, the Women's League does just an amazing job that's all I've got all right Councilmember Dewar Thank you, Mayor. Um, really appreciated your first Thursday event. Um, very nicely done, and I want to thank you for highlighting Michael's house in terms of its um, help to abuse children in Greene County. Such a worthy cause. Um, I didn't realize the entirety of the scope of the services that they provide. It really is quite amazing to have those types of wonderful advocates for our children. So thank you for bringing that to the fore, Mayor. Uh, I, too, attended the Touch a Truck event, and uh, we'll say that the Dewar kids were responsible for about half the noise of the <laughs> trucks blaring. 
I want to thank Phillips in particular because I think their truck was the loudest uh, <laughs> as a local business. Um, but it was a wonderful event. Um, I echo the comments of Councilwoman Schwartz. Just thank you to the city, to the township, fire department, many uh, that were involved. Uh, and this year they got the, the kids got to spray the, the water cannon as well, which right. was really awesome. So uh, there were also a couple of former Beaver Creek mayors that were um, Carol Graff and Brian Jarvis that were there and volunteering their time, so appreciate them. One of my daughters uh, got student of the month, and so shout out to her. Uh, so that was kind of neat at her elementary school, but I, I just think it's a great program that local schools do to recognize students and then uh, shine award to look at an outstanding student uh, kind of across the board. And then finally, uh, to thank Council Member Bales for his opening uh, prayer for Israel. Psalm 122.6, verse 6, calls on us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And it's a, a really brutal outbreak of violence. Uh, there, I was in Israel in 2018, and I came home with a lot of optimism, having spent time in the state of Israel and in the West Bank. But uh, in Gaza, it's just a very different situation. And so pray for those impacted, those taken hostage, and for peace to return. Councilmember Adams. Thank you, sir. Uh, I attended the graduation of the Citizens Academy. It was, it was an interesting conversation I had with several people. One, in, one person in particular said, I, I said, what did you get out of this? He says, I learned not to listen to my neighbors. <laughs> So he's got the truth, you know, whether it wasn't jaded. So that was good. Uh, I, I attended the Violence Free Futures fundraiser called Purses and Pastries out to Lavender Farm. That was an amazing event. Uh, I didn't win a purse. I didn't try to win a purse. So I just <laughs> but they do a, a really good job out there. I too was at the Rotary Club uh, rest stop out at Coy Middle School for the Tour de Gym. I've done that for a couple of years now. And uh, we had uh, the fire department, the fire department auxiliary, and Green, or Green uh, Beaver Creek Township was out there to assist with that. Uh, we had snacks, drinks, misting, sta misting station, even had a dinosaur to greet the uh, riders as they came in. I was able to attend a ribbon cutting of a new business in here in Beaver Creek called Impact Garage. It's uh, actually a dream, I guess, of a lady I go to church with. Uh, her father had fixed cars for people that couldn't afford to fix their cars when he was growing up or when she was growing up and she really wanted to do something and they were able to put this garage together where they can uh, work on regular cars for regular people and charge a, the normal price Monday through Thursday but then on Fridays they have an event where they can uh, you can go on their line at impactgarage.org and sign up based on what your qualifications you, you have very little amount of money to get your car fixed because they see the need to, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there that give clothing, food, things like that, but you need a car to go to work. And uh, that's one way they can do to give that back. So I highly recommend looking into them if you want to use somebody for that. I, too, attended the candlelight vigil at Violence Free Futures. I was fortunate enough to be able to read the proclamation for the group, uh, designating the month of October as uh, Violence Prevention Month in Beaver Creek and in Greene County. Uh, and I, too, serve on the board of uh, Violence Free Futures. And uh, it's one of those things that you really wish you didn't have to have, but you're really glad you have. Because uh, the women, actually, uh, women, men, and animals now, they, they take care of all of them. It's, uh, it's an amazing place out there. Uh, also was able to attend the Beaver Creek Chamber uh, local, uh, lunch local event at uh, Pizza Dive. That's an event that's every two, first Tuesday of every month, and they highlight a different restaurant here in Beaver Creek, and everybody goes out to try to support them. And if you've never been to the Pizza Dive, they've got some really interesting pizzas there. You need to go try them out. Uh, again, it's been said several times, the uh, Beaver Creek Women's League uh, Issues and Candidates Night, I think there was well over 140 people there. Uh, it was a great turnout, and uh, I think a, a lot of information got, got out that night. People could see what was out there, what they had to vote for. And, and as someone said, it's been recorded. I think it's been put out on the city's website and I think the chamber's website as well. Uh, I, too, was at the first Thursday event. Uh, and I, I thank you for highlighting Michael's house. That was, uh, that was great. 
what the Violence Free Futures does for the adults, Michael's House does for the kids. And uh, these abused kids that uh, all kinds of different abuses. And uh, I think the, the money that was raised that night, all the donations, the Holiday Inn where it was held, uh, matched it dollar for dollar. So I think they raised $1,300 in donations, and then they, it was $2,600 that went out to them. So I think that was a really good event. And I'm, thank you for putting that together. Uh, tri truck it was uh, was amazing. It is always it was a little cold to begin with. Uh, had to wear a coat, but other than that, uh, I think I'm trying to remember how many of these we've had. I think there's 15 or 16, and uh, I've only missed one. And uh, the chief knows why I'm really glad I missed that one. So I won't go into that. One. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you. All right. All right, Mayor's report. I don't. I have a few things to add, but uh, you can see everybody's been busy. Uh, I've been to some of these out things that were mentioned already, and some I was not present. But I do want to add that we had uh, on Saturday we had the there was the McGrath golf scramble, in memory of uh, a former employee here at the city, hmm. and it was a little cold, but everybody had a good time. Uh, I also, uh, a few weeks back, we had the new president of Wilberforce visit the city. And at that time, he invited us to come to the groundbreaking for their new stu student housing. So I went out there for their groundbreaking uh, last week. Uh, the Citizen Academy. You know, it is everybody that I talked to that came out of the Citizen Academy just said, it's unreal. I mean, they couldn't believe how the city was run and how we run this city so efficiently. And uh, so I, too, will encourage everybody to get on the wait. What's probably going to be a waiting list, but get on the list to uh, the longer that waiting list, the more likely that we might have more than one a year. So please uh, sign up for that and see if we can't... Uh, um, Make our voice heard so that people know what we do here at the city. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, I had uh, Ohio Mayor's Alliance meeting. Uh, it was last week. It was mostly updates on what's going on with uh, in Columbus, but uh, uh, nothing earth-shattering right now. But uh, and then we have the Greater Dayton Mayor's Managers coming up. Is this week or next week? This week. This week, so Wednesday. So uh, we'll be traveling a little bit. And lastly, for the uh, Women's League Candidates Forum, I do urge you all to go back and watch this. It is recorded. But I just want to let somebody know that uh, a certain individual on the forum decided to comment that uh, when they tried to reach me, I would hide under my desk. So I just want to let everybody know that this is my desk. There's no place to hide. <laughs> With that, I'm going to turn it over to the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. And I've attended uh, many uh, of the same events uh, you all have uh, as well. Uh, Try a truck. Thanks for all those that came out. It was a success. I was worried about the coolness, but uh, when the sun was out, it did warm up. Uh, the Citizens Academy, uh, again, same as I echo everybody else. Uh, they learned a lot of stuff, a lot of information. It's a wonder that we didn't literally see their heads explode with the amount of information over the six weeks that was presented to them. Um, got to know all of them as uh, Katie and myself attended all of them, and I was kind of the MC a lot of it, uh, opening and ending each one. And, of course, I presented a couple times myself. Uh, but it was a good time. This is the graduating class there. Uh, on the graduating night with city council that was invited. So congratulations to all of them. A great, great looking bunch. Uh, it, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, but a lot of fun. So uh, tune in, uh, tune in. Uh, trick or treat, Tuesday, October 31st, 6 to 8. Trick or treat, Tuesday, October 31st, 6 to 8. Trick or treat, Tuesday, October 31st, <laughs> 6 to 8. Uh, there are a lot of uh, other activities and churches and stuff. Uh, I would watch social media that uh, 
advertise many other opportunities uh, on weekends and other dates uh, to uh, make sure you have plenty of opportunities to have fun with the kiddos. So when is trick or treat? Uh, Tuesday, October thirty first, <laughs> six days. Rain, sleet, shine. Uh, and just uh, as a informational piece, the park levy can be found as you know, as you well know, city council passed resolution twenty three forty one, placing the park levy on the ballot. And so, uh, for factual information on the city, visit the city's website beavercreekohio.gov. Click on park levy tab, and it'll give you uh, some information including some additional information that uh, I'm very proud that staff has worked on, which is one of the most – it's like you, I have an easier time explaining rocket science to somebody, and I know nothing about rocket science, but gas and flame equals boom. Uh, but uh, there's about the uh, reappraisal process and uh, what that cost is. We have a calculator, uh, thanks to Mr. Casera, and working with a county auditor, uh, to, to show what it would uh, look like uh, with the new levy uh, because park, uh, levies, uh, the city, just because of reappraisal, the city does not receive any additional funding uh, just because the reappraisal goes up uh, on levies. We receive no additional. Uh, so with that, uh, but the new park levy, this shows a uh, calculator so somebody could put in their 2022 home value and the new home value and they can see what changes. Um, and then there's just uh, different links to the county auditor's website that explains it further. Uh, so please look at it as a resource, as factual information, just to give residents information and tools that they need to make educated decisions. Uh, and I believe that's all I have tonight. All right, very good. At this point on the agenda, the next item is citizen comment. Is there anyone here tonight who would like to address council on any issue whatsoever? If there is, please come forward. Give us a name and address. We ask that you limit your time to three minutes or have up to six minutes donated by other people. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. John Morris. I'm at 33 Greenwood Lane, Springboro, Ohio. I'm the Executive Director of the Home Builders Association. And I'd just like to come to Council and uh, commend you all and thank you for approving and moving forward with the rezoning crest, uh, re request for Bridal Wood. Uh, and it, just by happenstance, that's on. I was going to come regardless of whether you're actually looking into rezoning. But uh, back in June, uh, we issued a press release and shared that with each member of council and the mayor. Uh, Dayton is currently ranked as the fourth worst, si fourth worst city in the nation for housing availability. Uh, so it's imperative that council, uh, cities like Beaver Creek, find ways to work with our developers. You have an outstanding developer in Ober uh, Economic Development Group and uh, you have an outstanding economic and planning department here. So Mr. Burkett was nice enough to come and present uh, what the city of Beaver Creek's been doing to a uh, regional builder and developers forum. So, uh, and thank to council member Curran for coming to the event that we hosted for local candidates. Um, essentially the Home Builders Association, the Associated Builders and Contractors, the Dayton Region Manufacturers Association, the Board of Realtors are all regionally based and uh, available to each of you when you face issues because frequently uh, when you get a zoning request coming forward there's a lot of what ifs well what if traffic does this or what if a resident happens to cut down a tree <coughs> 20 years from now and those kind of things tend to stall and prevent developments from happening and we just want to make sure that you're aware that all these associations exist to help provide you with the fact-based resources you need to make good strong decisions um, because we are facing a housing shortage nationally, and we're facing a housing shortage in this region. So, again, just wanted to bring forward, and thanks to Council, the Mayor, your uh, wonderful development department for working with the developers on reasonable requests. Thank you so much. Thank you. Leave extra copies of my release. All right. Anyone else like to address Council? Please come on up. Please give us a name and address. Hi, Do you think you're going to need more than three minutes? I try to make it short. It took notes. Okay. okay, Denise Hurley, 3021 Southfield Drive. I back up the part at Tara. Um, I was thinking about some issues, and he just said traffic issues. So we have 117 proposed houses on the farm. Across the street, Oprah's also going to build over there, approximately 117. 
2.5 cars, that's 283 cars each. That's 566 cars times four trips minimum. We're talking 2,200 plus cars going in and out on South Upper Bellbrook. And that's before we get the high school built. Think of all the cars are gonna be on that corner. So that's the first thing I wanted to point out. Um, overstated he wanted a conservation easement. I appreciate you looking into that. We don't have a definition in Beaver Creek. I think Woodlands is appropriate. The one thing that I mentioned at the first meeting with Randy's group that it didn't go anywhere, why don't we deed those 25 feet to the homeowners in Tara and we'll be responsible. Tara Lake, those people were deeded the land up to the lake beyond their backyards. And also in Tara West, um, off a of plantation in the back, those people were deeded the land. They mow it, they take care of it, we could do the same thing. That would take it off the table. Because if the homeowners association gets it, they could vote in the future to clear that whole thing out and put a park in there, and we don't want that. We want the buffer, we want to be protected. And again, they said 25 foot of trees, nine foot of trees, and I'm the one that measured the horse path. So you can take that as accurate. Um, so that was my solution that I didn't get to mention. And then um, on the zoning commission, there's a man that sits in your spot, I don't know his name, and he's concerned about the stub streets and he wants access. Well, the United Church Homes that owns Trinity they have bought the land that is on Trinity to the east or west, I guess, between west. Trinity. And if you look at the two plots of land, they could take a cul-de-sac out in the southwest corner and stub that. They could go into that and then go on to Indian Ripple. And then we don't have to unstub our streets. So I think those are the issues I wanted to mention. All right. Okay, well, thank, thank you, you for very listening much. to me. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on up, if there is. Seeing none, we will close citizen input. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn, Your Honor. All in, have a motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Don, thank you. You're welcome.